The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. This Australian Investors Podcast episode is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, use the coupon code RASK and secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. We're proud to have the Intelligent Investor as an ongoing supporter of the Australian Investors podcast. As a result, RASK does not earn a volume-based fee. Simply head to intelligentinvestor.com.au or use the link in your podcast player to access your free trial. This episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is also proudly supported by SelfWealth, Australia's leading independent broker. Over 120,000 investors trust SelfWealth with over $9 billion in equities. With SelfWealth, you can trade ASX, US, and Hong Kong listed shares for a flat fee. On a $10,000 investment with Comsec, you'd pay $29.95 in fees. Yet with SelfWealth, it's just $9.50. The thing I like about SelfWealth is the full access to fundamental company data and how easy it is to trade US, Hong Kong, and Aussie shares in one place. You can see your Apple shares and ACDC ETF right beside each other. To join SelfWealth now, use the link in your podcast player or head to selfwealth.com.au and use the coupon code RASK during sign-up. Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. Please remember that all of the information in this podcast episode is limited to general information only. That means the information is not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should seek the advice of a licensed and trusted financial professional before acting on the information. And before you acquire or apply for a financial product, please read the PDS or product disclosure statement, which should be available on the issuer's website. Lastly, please keep in mind that past performance is not indicative of future performance. In this hour-long casual conversation, I chat with Claude Walker, founder of A Rich Life. You may know Claude from Twitter or from a previous Australian Investors podcast that I did with him. In this conversation, Claude and I talk about management. In particular, some of the subtle and more explicit signs that you can pick up on as an analyst when you're investing in small cap companies on the ASX. This conversation is pretty fast and loose, but it's just a casual conversation from two investors just trying to get better at analyzing management. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Claude Walker from A Rich Life. Mr. Claude Walker, thanks for taking the time out to join me on the show again, mate. That's great to be here, and Thanks for having me. Yeah, today we're going to talk management. We're going to talk incentives um, and everything in between. Had you on the show before, and many of our listeners uh, will know who you are from Twitter or from the stuff you're doing over at A Rich Life and um, from former roles. But maybe for those newer listeners, because our audience has grown quite a bit since I had you on the show last time, mate. Um, why don't you just tell us a bit about yourself and a bit about ri- A Rich Life? Like what, what are you doing over there and what's the general feel of it? Uh, so A Rich Life is sort of aiming to be a sort of different version of the AFR covering sort of news, arts, culture, and then um, business and, and finance and stocks. But mm-hmm. because um, there's, you know, a lot of coverage already in sort of like the big companies in the Commonwealth Bank and BHP and that kind of thing, mm. we rather than sort of try and compete with like, you know, an area that's already got good coverage and, and multiple different points of view, we, we tend to focus more on the smaller end or the medium companies as well. 
mm-hmm. on the stock market. And, uh, and the, the simple reason for that is because, you know, there's fewer people writing about that and, and that's, uh, there are plenty of people still that are interested in those companies though. So, so that's what we aim to cover. Mm. And uh, uh, we'll get to, I guess, the kind of choices that um, investors have for their news flow in Australia in a moment. And yeah, let's just say there's a lack of good quality information. Um, I'd say even if you go below 500 mil market cap in Australia, like it's, there aren't too many decent publishers out there that give you what you want. I mean, it, there are quite a few data providers that you can get like data that's been scraped or like high level stuff, but it's pretty hard to find good quality information the further you go down. I, I find fund managers are often a good source of insights because, you know, they, they're willing to talk about positions. But anyway, I digress. So, Claude, um, I'll encourage people to go back and I'll I'll put a, show, a link in the show notes to the other episode we did where it describes kind of how you invest and why you invest. But a lot of people that follow you know that you like small caps and – you have this, um, I guess, focus on, well, we can say ethical investing or ESG investing. Um, and today's discussion is kind of about how those two things come together and why they come together and why they work. Um, and I know you've got a heap of examples that we can that we can load up on to kind of hit home these points. Maybe I'll just give you an easy one. Um, so why small caps, mate? I think you might have answered that before, but why small caps? I love that question. Because uh, if you haven't realized this yet, it can be a sort of aha moment. And, and that is that there are many fewer people looking at small companies. And that means that uh, there's much higher potential for you as an individual having an insight that really does give you an edge that allows you to um, value and understand the worth of a, a small cap company better than other people. And I think this is, uh, you know, touches on a subject I want to get into later, but every single person um, has their strengths and weaknesses and anyone as an individual investor may have strengths that allow them to understand a smaller company much better than the overall market. And that's where uh, people can make uh, money based on their expertise. And if you cultivate a um, a particular interest in this area of the market, uh, you can, you know, maximize that advantage. And um, because the fewer people trading in these stocks and fewer people understand these stocks, it's, it's just a less efficient market. And so there's more um, potential for mispricing. So that's why that's why I initially started in small caps. And, and that's all just based on Buffett and, and all, you know, plenty of people have made this point. But because mm-hmm. I'm just a small person, like a small investor, I, I definitely want to maximize that advantage. And that's why I choose to look more at small caps. Yeah, I love it too because it, oftentimes the models, the business models are simpler, right? One thing um, I think you told me many, many years ago, this is a throwback to like when we were at the Motley Fool, you said to me that, oh man, you should focus on small caps because it's you can get your head around the ideas pretty quickly. And even to this day, I don't know if it's got better or worse. Like we have great platforms like Strawman, right, where you can go on and you can share your views on smaller companies as an investor. Um, but I don't know if it's getting any more efficient. Like I, I feel like it's it's still a bit, and we'll talk about this in a minute, like it can still be a bit like the Wild West. Um, but at the same time, that's why you go there. Like if you have your wits about you, it can be a, a fertile um, hunting ground. But I guess the key point is like having your, your wits about you, which is what we're going to talk about here. So why, mate, then why... Do you kind of intertwine the focus on small caps with, we can say like ethical investing or ESG? Um, like, how do those two combine to make something special for you? In answering that question, I can't avoid the fact that initially what I wanted to do was um, be part of uh, the sort of renewable energy industry and to um, manifest more uh, environmental energy sources. And I actually worked for a solar company for a while back in 2013 after I graduated. And uh, then there was a change of government and basically a lot of renewable energy activity shut down. So I was really just trying to um, respond initially to my frustration that there was all of this cool stuff we could be building and doing and demand side management and batteries and um, solar and all this sort of stuff. We could have done that in 2013 and I wanted to be part of that. 
and work on those deals and, and learn how to get grant funding and or however it, it works. But basically, um, that all just sort of shut that got shut down for political reasons in Australia. So I wanted to try and be part of the solution to that lack of funding. And um, one part of ethical investing is saying, oh, no, maybe we avoid tobacco or guns. But another part to me is we should push money towards constructive uses um, such as, you know, things that make people's lives better and make the economy more sustainable. And so that's why I initially got into investing. So that was actually the first step to like investing for me or the first impulse. Now I had, of course, dabbled in shares prior to that, but even before I dabbled in my first shares, um, you know, which I think we talked about on the last podcast, um, basically it was like I wanted to push money towards um, good things that I believed in. Mm. And then of course, in order to be able to influence money and to grow your own capital, you need to, you know, know how to do so in a way that the um, that increases the capital base that is influenced by you. So you need to be helping other people understand the world better in a way that they can then use um, to equip them to become more influential and have more capital. So my thinking is if, if I can talk directly to the people that want to make a better world and try and increase their power in the world by giving them the tools they need to invest themselves, then that will, will be the best impact I can have to, you know, advocate for um, hmm. a cleaner economy and other things that I believe in. Hmm. That's a really interesting way to frame it, kind of just a, it being an enabler. Um, and that's, if you go to an which, adaptive enabler, that's that's actually an investing concept, but it's also what I want to be, what I want my business and my life to to be uh, doing in the economy as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to be you want to be proud of it, and I guess a rich life does that now that you can bundle like uh, the 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 arts uh, culture together with investing. I think you can intertwine them so well. Um, okay, so one of the things that you and I have talked about, and we talked about this today and yesterday is this idea that in small caps, you can, by even directing money to companies that you think are doing good or avoiding doing bad, um, you can um, invest alongside great management teams. So management teams that are incentivized for long-term outcomes, these kind of, I guess you call it conscious capitalism, where there's many stakeholders, not just the shareholders in some of these, um, in the minds of some of these management teams. And we've got... Yeah quite a few really good examples here, mate. So in small cap land, um, what, not many individual investors know this, but the access to management is often pretty good. So if you send a re- an, e- an email off, you might get a reply if you word it correctly. Whereas in large cap land, it's hard to get uh, ex- exposure to those management teams. So I guess this, ho- this conversation is going to be a bit wide ranging, but let's just start off with like why management is important in a small small business. And then we'll go into the the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah, great. And I, and I think you've um, touched on a lot of the advantages of looking at small companies. But uh, the now that we're there, now that we actually, for example, have access to management, even as just a small investor starting out. You know, I know many good CEOs who've replied to someone who was just starting out and earnestly had a question. They tried to answer their question, and they also just looking for guidance from the CEO. They, but how do we then um, use that position to um, be better investors? There's a lot to think about, but I think that um, I'll, I'll make the final link to ESG, which is I think if you're starting out as an investor and you want to invest for the long term, um, it's an advantage again to focus on um, ethical businesses and stuff like that. Because think about this: if you're if if the CEO is the CEO of say Pro, Pro Medicus and they're trying to sell you know, this software that they want uh, radiologists to trust um, with their patients' well-being, you know, um, it's important for that company to, you know, put medicine first and have that, like, correct healthcare ethos Mm. because they're interacting with doctors and doctors are the buyer. But that's not just true of ProMedicus. That's true of, and, you know, I think everyone knows this, this is my largest shareholding, which is why I use this as an example. (laughs) But um, it's true of any healthcare company if, for example, that is interacting directly with doctors um, and nurses, like you've got some people that can really care about the patients that may be, you know, really involved in the decision here. So I do think healthcare and healthcare te- technology, as long as it's a real business, is actually a good place for um, beginner investors 
to look. Um, but it could be anything that as long as the company is like, you know, got a high minded ideal that makes sense, that that could be a better company to look at and, and to start with. Um, because you're mm. you're more likely to be steered in the right direction rather than misled by management. Mm. Um, but then there are so many instances, right, where people do get these ideals and they stick to them. Like, let's just think about like biotech, right? Like how many small cap biotechs out there that are just absolutely rubbish? Um, but they're like, we're going to cure this, we're going to cure that. And they're just promotional CEOs, right? Exactly. I mean, so that's the other thing to remember about industry. I'm glad you brought that up is like, if you go to investing purely because like, oh yeah, I really care about green tech. I want, I want to find this, you know, renewable energy company. There is, there is somebody also waiting on the other end then that does not have a re- real business who is just going to sell you an idea and take as much money from as many people as possible. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have to be absolutely certain, and this isn't even to do with management. You have to be certain here that you're actually investing in real businesses. So, you know, that's probably a good thing to mention too is is there's some assumed knowledge in in the discussion we're going to have about how we um might you know look at a company and and use the evidence to make judgments about management i think um Mm. it's important to note that there's some assumed knowledge here which is that you're investing in companies that have real products that have real paying revenue that that revenue is manifesting in actual cash flow that you can verify there's a real product Mm. um and this is all you know, that's really all important stuff. Um, but then within that, even once you have a real business and all that's true, then you have this big range of um, other terms that we're increasingly using um, and that we are relying on management for. So a good example is things like annualized recurring revenue, recurring revenue, subscription revenue, um, contracted annualizing and annualized recurring revenue, etc. Um, these none of these terms are necessarily audited. I think you know some of the revenue terms may be audited, but a lot of these terms are just management figures. And in any company, but especially small caps, when we're looking at these figures, we need to um, essentially whether management is being conservative and reasonable and, and trying to give an accurate picture of where the business is at, or whether they're trying to always give the best possible interpretation um, and make them the numbers look as good as possible. It's very important. Like the the nature of management and what we think of them is extremely important in any analyzing companies, especially small companies, when the difference between actual revenue, that is the amount that they can book in the audited books and say contracted annualized recurring revenue might be quite large. Mm. And, you know, in this day and age, we've got people doing some pretty fast valuations, just, you know, multiplying revenues to try and get, you know, valuations. Um, That's pretty dangerous if you start relying on sort of management um, underlying revenue numbers. And, and, you know, lots of companies, almost every company does have sort of management numbers they present. So I'm Mm. not discarding these numbers, but I'm just saying that even if we're going to look at these numbers, then who management are and, and how we think of them definitely becomes important, even when you're looking at the numbers. And I guess that's, that was why it seemed like a, a good good subject to, to focus in on for this chat. Yeah, I, and so, yeah, two things in that. We're assuming some knowledge here, right? Like we're talking about management of companies and like legitimate companies that have business models. We did a, I did, did a great podcast, a chat with um, Luke Winchester, who I know you know, um, about kind of ways you can channel check. And, and we talked about last year or the year before about, you know, how you actually, you know, uh, get information on small caps and the difference in that research approach. So we're assuming that knowledge for this podcast. So the other th- the, the other thing is like I think you said to me previously that small management teams, like in smaller companies, management um, can kind of have a bigger sway because they're not like run by corporations with many thousands of investors who can get a board to vote out a CEO, et cetera. Sometimes these people are ingrained in this business, so it's even more important. But there's one thing in this, Claude, and one thing that it's kind of one of these angles that you need to understand if you haven't been in industry is that is that where the incentives also lie for the researchers. So we found a company, we're, we're looking at the company. Um, one of the things that people do is they often go to a research report by a broker. Why do you, like, I'm not going to plant the seed here. Maybe I'll let you go, go for this. But can are brokers a reliable source for, I guess, an assessment on management? Yeah, so bro- 
a lot of actual stockbrokers that work for the big firms, they're actually really savvy and they do know a lot of stuff. Um, so uh, that I guess it, it depend on the broker. But um, I guess what you're really are like what you're asking about is in particular broker research, especially yeah, since you know that's what, yeah. people emailing that around. Even sometimes you might just see a little excerpt from broker broker research on on um, either quoted in an article or or even on Twitter or something like that. So that's a good question and. Uh, I think that the reality is that um, it def- you definitely need to be aware that what brokers cover may depend, um, especially in small cap land, may depend on whether they have other business relationships with those companies. So what you do tend to see is that if a broker like raises capital for a small cap company, then they're obviously more likely to provide coverage of that company, which you know just ma- makes sense. Um, and, and they often do have, you know, a good understanding of the company. So it's not that I would um, mistrust broker research, but at the same time, um, especially for companies that are like bur- either like they're burning cash and they're really going to need money, but more likely, you know, they, they need, they want money to grow and stuff like that. You know, these firms, especially once there's sort of two or three firms covering them, they sort of do have an incentive to say nice things about the company um, for multiple reasons. Mm. Um, but part of it is it's just because you know they know that they're going to be probably in a position where they're going to be wanting to raise capital for the company so it doesn't make a lot of sense for them to be super harsh on valuation does it because who because the best thing for existing shareholders who are also their clients is if they raise at a good a good fair price to existing shareholders now there's nothing wrong with that but it's definitely worth being aware of that dynamic yeah and that, and this is this is like kind of like follow the incentives type thing as well, right? Like if yeah, so if, if you and I come out and say something, there's not like there's not that much recourse for us as kind of independence. But it, you know, if you have that relationship, there is, right? Yeah, well so that's an, that's that's the other thing we're thinking about. And I think maybe this falls nicely, this leads nicely to like, you know, the first little example um of of the things I use to like, you know, help shape my impression of management which is you get, so you get these earnings calls, right? And often the people that ask, the analysts that ask questions on earnings calls, um, they, you know, their firm, the firms that cover the company, they may have done the IPO or something like that. And, you know, I had an interesting story, which couldn't just let um, people into my thinking that I can, that I can share, which is this new sort of IPO um, of this sort of retailer called My Deal. And, uh, essentially what happened was I, you know, I owned shares in this company cause I just thought like just a small position just cause I wanted to follow along with it. It seems like an interesting online retailer, it, it, you know, got some hyper growth as a lot of them have in the COVID period. And so I, I bought some shares and I'm following that along. And then I dialed into the earnings call and, um, basically, you know, listen to their presentation. And then I have this one little question. It wasn't even a hard question. I don't recall precisely what it was, but it was just, you know, something to do with their sort of funnel because, you know, these guys sort of, they have the business model where they try and get as many users to, to have well, at least one transaction as possible. And then they've got the email address and then they send you marketing and stuff like that. So you similar to Pogan and all that sort of thing. Yep. And, you know, um, the operator, so I asked a question and then it, it went through and then, the um in the investor relations people emailed me and said, Oh, we'd be happy to chat to you, you know, we'll we'll organize a chat for afterwards. And then the operator was like, Oh, there are no further questions. And um and then, you know, ended the conference call. And I did have a chat with the CEO and it was a good chat. And, you know, I thought he seemed really great. But I still was just so shaken by like it just it just put me off that um they hadn't taken my question on the call and that they just had some like it felt very stage managed i guess um so i actually ended up selling my shares in that company i only had a small position anyway because i was just i was just interested i didn't have any conviction behind it um now I, that may prove to be wrong but i would have gotten a lot more comfort and, and i might buy shares in this company again but um i would have gotten more comfort if i had heard me and even like some retail shareholders or Ideally, you know, anyone from the peanut gallery to come and ask the CEO questions. Yeah. Um, even if some of those questions weren't so good, but just because for me, that is a heuristic of good management. For, and I'll give you an example of the opposite. I remember Nanosonics, which I do own shares in to this day, 
many years ago when I first covered it for Motley Fool Hidden Gems, um, the share price was, you know, $2 or something, around $2.20 or something like that, 60 And um, the it was still a decent sized company. And the CEO would take for like questions for like the full hour. They'd do their presentation and then they'd go pretty much for 60 minutes. And they had a lot of questions from analysts. But even back then, while they were a decent sized company, they'd have a few questions from shareholders or, um, you know, just whoever called in. And mm-hmm. that was sort of really interesting because you get some out of left field questions. Some weren't so good, but some were interesting. And it gave an opportunity for shareholders who'd done a little bit of research and had a niggle about the company to actually put what to them might be a hard question. Um, so, yeah, and and on top of that, I guess, you know, yeah, I, I'll leave it at that, actually. But, yeah, so, that's so an wh- example of good and bad to me. So why why is, like, some people don't know this, but um, um, we know this. If you, if you listen to some of the big um, blue chip companies' calls, you probably get the idea feeling of, that this happens but operators will actually screen calls um, and choose questions that they prefer obviously they can be selective because they have so many coming through but why is like this idea of set questions so questions that are kind of like the management want to answer because it's it's fluffy and it's lovely why is having anyone like other than the transparency why is that a good sign for management i guess integrity Oh, that, that's a tough question. I'm not quite sure I know I understood it correctly. Um, well, can you rephrase it? Yeah, sure. I think the the way you put it to me previously is you like to see unpredictability in questions and like management yeah, exactly. embracing that. Yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. So it's just the, it's the willingness to take random questions that I have found to me has correlated with um, companies that have like generally had like been in my view also well managed and I'm, I'm sort of grateful for when I was, have been covering a lot of different companies. You know, there's been a lot of questions I've asked at AGMs, for example, is a good opportunity, like, you know, in, in non-COVID times, I've been a, keen to attend AGMs with different companies just to ask a few questions or whatever. And the, that kind of unpredictable environment tells you more about, I guess, the people involved. How do they hand, handle a crowd, you know? Mm. Um, especially a, a crowd that is there partly to like ask antagonistic questions because they want to give them a run for their money. And that, that sort of stuff is great to see. And I want to see management to sort of embrace that more and, and do less, I guess, stage managing. And we're talking about small companies here, right? Like there's definitely a time and a place for companies to have like organized systems. Like Commonwealth Bank can't have the sort of an unstage managed AGM. But because we're looking at small companies, it's sort of interesting to see where they're at with that and um it's pretty it should be pretty obvious to anyone that you have a better opportunity of you know getting an interesting insight um when a manager is like answering something unexpected Mm. uh, and and, and then the other thing is just as a matter of integrity wouldn't it be the best thing is when you've got sort of um fluffy questions that you would like to answer i think you can just publish a sort of q and a and sort of have your investor relations person, um, you know, answer, ask those questions and, and just publish that as part of your materials and, and then have the, the random questions come at you it would be the ideal thing in my view. But you don't see that sort of stuff too often. Yeah. Um, I, there, there's some, there's the, the, speaking of variability, the variability in the way management answer questions is marketing. There is so many, uh, I guess, CEOs out there who are truly passionate about a product, right? And they they love to have different questions because it tests them. And they're kind of on the fly. They're like, oh, yeah, but this is how it relates back to our core values. Like I'm, I'm thinking of the Okta CEO um, and he's just, I just love the way he presents. Todd Binkidden, he's just like, he just, it comes back to like first principles and everyone can understand it. Uh, but then you get some CEOs that just flat out deny talking like um or answering questions in, at all like uh, maybe i won't name names um part of our small cap research service the, the rockets program mm-hmm. we have a ceo we tried to interview all the ceos and publish them for our members and one of them said we don't talk to investment clubs without even hearing what i had to say just said we don't talk to investment clubs and i guess just the respect is a, is an important one like we are co-owners in your business so we deserve to to speak with the person that you know has our money and not enough people think like that, I reckon. Um, yeah. yeah, go on. 
that just oh, that's just a brilliant segue what you just said into one of the other companies that I wanted to talk to you about that w- that's an example of how um, I guess spotting bad management can make you money but on on the flip side okay um, so if you're up for it we could talk because what you just said then about was this example of when you tried to reach out to um, management and they just wouldn't talk to you right mm-hmm. and that reminded me of an article I read uh, a few years ago about the previous management of um, Corum Group oh, yeah. and it was the the fund manager um, micro uh, Carlos Gill of Micro Equities wrote an article, I think it was published on mm, FN Arena maybe, and um, he basically, uh, those na- that, that may be ro- uh, wrong details, we'll check that and correct it in the notes if it's wrong, but uh, basically that article was saying, oh, he wouldn't like this company because, um, you know, management wouldn't speak to him. Mm. And I, in, I wouldn't have a golden rule that says if management don't speak to you, then the company isn't good. But I would say... Um, that, you know, in that case of Corum, like man- management was in a, in not in a good position at all. Like what happened with that company is that it was 57% owned by the one major shareholder who had just complete control and one of his associates was running the company. And they were just running this software company, by the way, which I now own shares in. Um, they were running this software company for cash, like basically trying to max out on dividends. Um, they had a pharmacy software product that had, you know, previously... I think um, market share of around 40%. During their tenure, this went from around 40% to 20%. And this company was going backwards. It had like a really good market position and it was just being like run into the ground. Um, And it wasn't until, you know, more recently, like last year, I think that a different group of, that that big major shareholder was finally diluted out of being in control and then the board sort of changed and new management came in. And now, and I think, you know, at that point in time, if you'd bought in, you know, just around the time that was happening, the share price, I think I'm just checking as we speak, was around four cents maybe. Yeah, it looks Um, like it. Or or even lower. And then there was sort of this management uh, change and... Uh, they also made an acquisition, which looks to be, you know, interesting. And basically they're going to attempt a turnaround. But what I did and what other people did is basically if you had spotted the fact that this was a decent business years ago, but had recognised that the issue was that the management had the wrong strategy, to say the least, um, then when you saw that change of management, and I was a bit slow on the uptake here, but when you saw that slow change of management, that should have been a sign. That could be a sign that's essentially, hey, this is there's something has happened and it's not reflected in the price yet. Mm. And it's certainly not reflected in the results yet, because management have only just, you know, changed change. So how can they immediately get the results heading in the right direction? Mm. But you know, I, I did buy shares in that and I think I'm up, you know, around hundred percent in not that long. I wish I'd gone in more volume. Uh, maybe not 100%, I'm saying up about 50%. Um, but either way, you know, I'm, I still think that this could have a long way to play out. But that's an example of spotting that the, the management um, in that case was a bit of an issue for the business. That is essentially they didn't want to engage with external shareholders and they, they had prior, their own priorities. Hmm. That, yeah. That's a key insight that can be useful later on. Yeah, I think uh, it's, is it Peter Lynch. I, I could be totally butchering this, but I think he said you want to own companies that even a monkey could run because sooner or later one will. And um, mm. there's that one. But then there's a, the, the, that um, from Pat well, Dawson. Just on that one, I guess when I hear that, I sort of think, well, you also want to be able to, um, you want to be able to spot when when that management change happens and probably just just sell when a bad manager comes in. Yeah, yeah. And um, we'll get to some ideas in just a second. But then the other one was, then the other, I guess, analogy is from Pat Dorsey who says, like, you can focus on the jockey or the horse, but if you had to pick one, you'd probably go with a good horse because um, at least it will get you somewhere. Um, it's it's That's an interesting thing. So, like, it, it kind of was a state of play that needed the shareholder to kind of get booted for some change to happen. I had Mark Tobin on the show, who I know you know, um, and he was saying that too much is too much in terms of like insider alignment. So we talk about skin in the game a lot, but, you know, he was saying, I think from memory, like if you get over 30%, then you have to really question 
you know, the insiders and really have a good understanding of how they're going to treat smaller shareholders because, um, you know, what is their incentive? Is it agency or is it long-term value creation? Um, do you have a view on that? Yeah, well, I think Mark is, is spot on. And actually, like in the early days of my investing, I remember like in a very rudimentary way, you know, surveying the performance long-term winners and looking what the management um, holding was in each case. Mm. And in that sort of anecdote, in, in that very sort of anecdotal, not big data way, I remember sort of drawing to the conclusion that it was best to have, you know, the person running it sort of somewhere between, you know, 20 and 40%, I guess. Yeah, right. Um, although, you know, truth be told, a lot of my bigger, my biggest winners and my best ones personally, a management or at least a duo or, or, or a family or a very few number of people have essentially had more than 50%. Yeah. So, you know, I don't think you necessarily want just one person um, single-handedly having 57%, but if there's a couple or, or three that do, then, you know, I think you're in a pretty good position there as well. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's sort of my view on that. How, how about... I, I, Hmm. I'm willing to definitely willing to invest when a few people have easy majority control, but of course that's when it becomes absolutely key uh, to sort of think about, you know, what, what people are doing and, and whether you trust them. And, um, you know, also what I guess like the direction of their trading is. Uh, so if they have, it may not be very useful information that somebody has 60% of their company left after when it IPOs, if, you know, they're actually just in the process of getting rid of that last 60%. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that length of holding, for example, would be an interesting one as well. Yeah, um, true. To, to, you, to add. You brought up a, a, a company uh, recently, which might go back to like kind of the, the more so the management side of things um, and like ju- making that judgment. I um, mean, this is like the accounting meets management analysis type thing. Um, and there's a company called Urbanize. Um, oh yeah that's right yeah so so that's basically one that i wanted to talk about because it's one it's this play that that is like the management change play but that's one that sort of played out a little bit already so Mm. if you looked at the chart of urbanized long term you know this thing went from like well above a dollar to like three cents or whatever and i come um scarily close to actually recommending this when i was advisor of or when i was an analyst or advisor at um Motley Fool Hidden Gems. But then what we spotted or what I spotted was that uh, they had this weird accounting uh, situation where they were bringing in the revenue ahead of the cash flow, essentially. So they were booking as revenue, um, you know, money that they had not yet received, but, you know, had, I guess, contracts to receive. Mm. And this was just like making the, you know, results look way better than they really were. So that was the that just that weird weird accounting trick that they used, you know, prior to the share price crash. That was, and just around like they used that essentially for the, around the IPO period and, and the escrow period for the big shareholders, and then uh, it just made the results look artificially good. And that was the tell for us that uh, you know basically not to trust that company, and you know that was why I like avoided it. And then I actually did end up, I did buy some shares in this company at one point. I sold them um, Mm. subsequently, but this thing went down to, um, from 50 cents, actually. I I, I swear it did actually get above a dollar at some point, but uh, maybe my memory is mistaken. Yeah, it did, it did. Um, So yeah, it went up above a dollar and then basically, you know, none of the cash flow from, not none, but the cash flow from all this revenue didn't come in. They ended up writing off a bunch of stuff and their share price goes down to like three cents or whatever. They have a little bit of a board change, some of the same players involved still, but also, you know, the key thing is the management team come gets out. There's a new CEO in. The new CEO is talking a much different game, talking about getting it cash flow positive, buying shares himself on market. This was the buy signal essentially. Mm. And sure enough, you know, it's doubled since then. In I think it was 2019 that that buy signal sort of came. Um or 2018, but, you know, as late as 2019, you could buy it at like three or four cents. And now it's eight and a half cents as we're recording this right now. Mm. Um, and, and, and that's one that, 
you know, sort of, I'm still holding some shares at the moment because I'm sort of, sort of interested in how it goes long term. But in large part, my thesis has played out now. So, you know, this company now previously, it was talking about um, getting cash flow positive and all that sort of thing. Now it's changed tack again and it's going back to how it wants to burn cash and grow revenue as fast as it can, um, which the market might like. Um, and it might succeed or it might not, but it's not really the thesis that I initially signed up for. So I'm so I have been exiting this investment now. But it's just, it's just to me, like the returns on that was totally satisfactory. So that's that's an example of you know how just following a change in management and sp- spending the time to to get to know who is the new crew and all that sort of thing can be uh, a valuable use of time. And and mm. in this small cap land having a new group of people that have got a better strategy that the market likes more can make it make a company, um, you know, make its results look better, but also make its share price re-rate. Did so you, that, that's what you go for. Did you, with that in, in particular, did you, like, do you look back in time at what where the management have been before and track them through time? Like, how do you make that assessment? Like, it's it's great to say, like, oh, yeah, we're going to be cash flow positive now as opposed to this guy that just blew it up. Um, but then how do you actually make that assessment to be, you know, yes, I can, if, I, I can see what you've done or, you know, I like you. Yeah. Here's my new thesis. So, de- so definitely I do do that. You know, it's important to look at not just management, the board members. In the case of Urbanize, um, this is testing me off the top of my head, but I'm fairly sure that the CEO now had previously worked maybe at a customer of Urbanizers. I can't remember, but it was somebody, um, you know, very adjacent in the in the industry. So he definitely knew what he was getting himself into. And he was sort of senior at another company, but then this was a step up for him. So you could, and then he just, oh, it just seemed like the kind of person. And look, the results have been better since, since he's been in charge. The board changes what wasn't as sort of comfortable with. There was still a lot of the same or similar players that had been involved. Mm. Um so I don't know exactly um, what the, you know, the direction is or, or how to reconcile the sort of very bumpy history uh, yeah. with that. Obviously, the difference was these guys, um, there was like private equity and stuff involved before the IPO. A lot of them were sort of selling around the time of the IPO, um, or at least certainly not buying. But this crew that had sort of been sort of involved for ages, they were the ones essentially that recapitalized it at, um, you know, three cents or four cents or or 2.7 cents, I can't remember exactly, but it really at the, at the lows, they were the ones putting capital in, recapitalizing the company after it sort of crashed down quite a long way. Mm. Hey. So you could definitely say that they were aligned and that mm. and that is sort of consistent with my thesis. Like these guys were fully aligned at, at this price and then you actually had sort of a substantial shareholder who was sort of in at that price um, or buying at that price. You sort of had that um, shareholder selling out a little bit of his shares um, and and um, not that long ago when it was more like seven or eight cents there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's sort of stuff I look at as well for sure. Yeah, it, it, and so for people that um, maybe are new to small caps, again, when we say signals and we're talking about these different factors that we consider, it's not just, you know, CEO has been buying equals good. It's not as simple as that. Like we, at, when you talk about, we talk about mosaic theory and we talk about, you know, building the picture of what the company is and its investment thesis and your, 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 I guess, objectives for that company and that in, then informs your modeling. We're saying the same thing about management. These coordinators talking about some of the different factors you might consider and how you can think about them. Um, there was one, co- was one, one other thing here, but it kind of slipped my mind. I guess it was around the question of like, I see in this in small and mid caps quite often is it's often a founder that's like a, what I would call a financial, I'm no, sorry, not a founder, a CEO, a financial CEO, a financial management team. So someone that isn't necessarily a technical lead. Mm. Um, yeah. Which always kind of, it, it, it kind of, as someone who started a business, I kind of get concerned by that. But then I wonder, does that really matter? Like, does, it, does it really matter to you to have a technical mm. person in charge? It's, so having a technical person in charge is certainly something I look for. Um, especially depending on the size, but especially in smaller companies. Hmm. Um, I Sometimes you do see smaller companies that have, I guess, like the person in charge is the person that like knitted it together and is like more of a deal maker yeah. rather than yeah. um, like somebody who's like a, an expert in the area of industry or service that the company is in. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't generally like that. Um, 
Now, sometimes you get sort of okay results in those sort of situations. Um, yeah. As long as everyone's sort of adequately aligned. But no, that's not what I prefer. Like when I think about the companies that I'm most happy, um, well, it depends, you know, yeah, I like, I definitely like to see industry expertise. It's that, it's that simple. And I like to see a sort of a, ideally either a, a CEO or COO who is like, you know, got clear operational expertise. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Sometimes there is a case to be made for like, there are certain horses that require certain jockeys and, um, you know, there are companies that need to raise capital. So they, you need a manager that is a bit of a hustler, but sometimes if you're, you know, if you're looking at companies that their their sole aim, like a like a zero in the early days, is to delight their customers, you want someone that understands the problem, the problem set, right, and like gets it. Um, and I find that is more common in a technical lead. Um, so there's another company that I know you've written about recently, called, and it kind of comes back to one of the things that most people think about when they think about judging management and that is incentives um and we've it's a kind of a yeah i guess it's an indirect way to deal with this this issue and talk about something else but um i know there's a company on the ISX you've written about recently called one view healthcare ah uh, one view yeah it's yeah. been on it's been on i guess you know we had a chat about it yesterday and it's, it's interesting because it really goes to um gives an insight into like the very industry we operate in and i think that the read the story of one view one view itself isn't necessarily super remarkable but for the listeners i'll just say you know so one view is a company that does sort of uh healthcare nurse interface systems what like it's like a their one view box or whatever is a thing that gives you the nurse call and tells you a meal about your hospital stay or something like that you know there's they're far from the only offering on the market look and none of this story is really about one view as an investment prospect you know its history which is there for anyone to see in the long-term chart is it, it floated you know great promise its share price i think was above five dollars then you know whatever didn't deliver now share price was below five cents so that's a minus 99 percent thing you know maybe it's got maybe it's got too low now it, it's a real business with real revenues from what i can tell at least from just looking at the statements um but it does lose a lot of money yeah uh, and yeah, basically what, uh, what happened a few, what, what's interesting about it is the, just the, the blatant new financial advice business model that caused its share price to skyrocket from eight cents to where it sort of closed, like above, I think it got to a high of 22 cents or something like that. Yeah, and, yeah I think it uh, even went up again today as we record. Oh, so, there we go. So now it's 22, now it's, it's, it's back on the fly. Um, so what happened here, and, and this is the really interesting thing, is, you know, essentially the the timeline, and you can find actually the timeline in in an article on um, a rich life, which is yeah, Google, put a link like, in the show notes. View a rich life, yeah. Um, but basically, th- there's um, this com- this a company called the S three Consortium that did a deal with. Um, one view and, and the way it all played out was that the first thing that happened is S3 Consortium who owns um, the next investors uh, put they first got got shares from one view um, they had an agreement to get they had an agreement to get um, you know over 6 million shares in lieu of 375k as consideration for using stocks digital, um, to share its research, commentary, and investment thesis on the company, the company being one view. And on top of that, S3 Consortium and um, other investors in the S3 Consortium network were going to buy 16.66 mil- million shares at $0.06 cents per share, which was under the sort of share price of $0.08 cents when this sort of thing was announced to the market. Claude, can so I... They got- can I interrupt? I'm just going to bring some clarity to this. So we've got a listed company, a company on the ASX. It's called OneView. It does health software. And then it was it made a partnership with another company, um, S3 Consortium, but it goes by the name of Stocks Digital, and it has a bunch of these websites that talk about stock markets and investing. Yeah, yeah, we should. Stuff like that. So there's kind of like there's two parties. There's the listed company and then there's the publisher. Um, yeah, who- so and the publisher, the, this S3 Consortium, 
this that, that has a whole network um, of sites that they actually own. I think that sort of the main brand is Next Investors, mm. um, and they and they have a sort of scorecard um, page of all of these stocks that they've like you know released reports on, and um, you know, you know they basically say invest alongside us. And, um, you know, basically encouraging people to, like, you know, get on board with the stocks that they're already long. Um, now, I'm not quite sure um, about all of the companies on this on this scorecard, but I know for a fact that when I looked at it yesterday, the scorecard showed our entry price as $0.08 cents for one view, but actually they got in a bit lower than that. So that was sort of the first a bit weird thing. Mm. And... Uh, on, on, and then what ended up happening was so they the market announcement goes out saying that they'd done this deal, but they had already sent out to their investors or, or sorry their people there. I guess you'd call them clients, even though they're not paying money. They're just getting the free emails from Next Investors. They send their report um, that declares OneView Healthcare to be its um, 2021 tech stock pick of the year out to their whole sort of database. And then when the stock opens, it opens above 14 cents. So it's jumped from 8 cents, you know, pretty much no volume in the stock, hardly any shares traded, like just over a million, averaging just over a million shares per day Mm. at, you know, 7 or 8 cents. And then this explodes the next day, starts trading up at 14 cents as all these people receive this email and rush out to buy this stock. And that day, over like 270 million shares trade um, and the and the share price you know gets up to I think twenty cents and, and closes at sixteen cents or whatever, and then we have the weekend, and then um, the next Monday morning is sort of round two of this mass email thing, and I'm not th- this is not all the places that emails came from. If some people got emails that I don't mention, you know, please send them to me for the for the archive, but they got. Um, second max emails from at least four other sort of organizations uh like sort of of, and you you can see what they are on the website in my article but these all came out the ones that we got forwarded between 8 30 a.m and 9 30 a.m so pre-market you just i don't know how many thousands of emails were sent out but so many to all of these people and then sure enough it boosts the stock up again you know the next day and this is just this amazing you know this there's been no fundamental development in the business. They haven't announced a big new contract. They haven't put out their results or anything like that. This is just you email enough people this excited thing about, you know, the stock you know, let, and, and the share price goes up. Yeah. And this is so, yeah, I, I, I guess I don't, I don't want to talk my book too heavily here, Claude, but there aren't many of us in Australia, these publishers. So we've got a website, we call it Rest Media. Um, a Rich Life does the, the journalistic side of things, uh, the AFR, um, the Motley Fool. These businesses operate websites that you can visit and it's basically that the model is funded by subscribers. So there's an incentive there for that organisation. Whereas many... And, and so all of these organisations, I should say, like are, have either at one point or another or do now do some sort of advertising so for example we also advertise people we advertise share site essentially yeah on our website and if people like click our link and try share site and like it and pay then we get a little bit which which we say but that you know us is us having an incentive to get people to um buy share site that's not going to that's not like a, a company paying me to say hey claude i'll pay you money go and put out you mm. know fu- just email your favorable thing about us to as many people as possible and it was favorable like this report you know from memory i can't remember seeing what the what the loss that the company made was for example i didn't think it i don't even know if it actually said it's losing money but i didn't see what the what the loss was or even what the market cap was or even in many of the basics that i would if someone asked me oh claude what's your number one stock and adam for 2021 you know i'm at least going to say some sort of consideration like oh this is my number one stock at six cents but now it's 14 cents it's not my number one stock anymore do you know what i mean yeah. i didn't see them say on that oh we like this at six cents they're just like we've made a massive investment and everyone rushes out to buy it at 14 cents um 
Yeah, go on. I was, yeah, and I was, I was also going to say just on that that you, you you generally have to have some sort of risks. You know, in investing, there are risks. Uh, that's the difference between putting money in the savings account um, and and investing. It involves risks, and um, yeah, you'd expect that. But my the second part of my point was that I've just named four websites. I can't off the top of my head think of well, straw man's not really a publisher. It's just a, it's like a forum where you go to share. Yeah, for, so, straw man's probably like your next best source for, um, com- for company content. That's not ultimately paid for by companies themselves. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what bit. we're talking about here. Like a company is like, I would like people to publish nice things about us. Well, there's ample ways for them to make that to happen. Yeah. But what they can't do is get somebody who has a long track record, or well, maybe they could, and this sort of corruption can actually happen. But what I don't think that we're seeing on Strawman, for example, is any of this. I'd be surprised. Maybe it exists, but you can't get some really good user who's got a track record of doing heartfelt things and you can see what they've said over a year or more and has a good ranking and they've picked stuff and their track record's tracked by Strawman. If that person then is giving an opinion, that's probably, you know, that's probably not funded by the company. So I do think you're right to mention straw man in, in yeah. the same sort of sentence, but you're right. You know, there's very few outlets covering companies um, that don't actually ultimately get their funding from the companies and, and that's that's who's paying, right? Yeah, and that's it. So no, the oh. incentives. Go on. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. I was, uh, I was, there are more. There are actually others that we haven't mentioned, but we won't try and do an exhaustive list because then we'll inevitably miss out somebody. Yeah. But, um, you yeah. know, yeah. I, I just should put on record. You know, that's not that. That's not everyone. There are other people that don't have that business model, and and there are a lot of. There is a lot of good. Yeah, there are. There are. There, there are many great outlets out there, but there many of the the ones that you probably know if you're listening to this, the stock market news and some of the forums. They're actually funded by the company. So they're more, uh, yeah. you know, a PR business, not uh, a business that's set up. So the, okay. and advertising though, so in its in a sense, though, anyone that takes advertising could be funded by the companies, but you just have to think, you, you have to look, you know, just because they've got some funding from a company doesn't mean that um, they're actually having that funding influence their editorial. And I'll give you a good example. Like, so like, you know, Ausbiz did a great cent, cent, um segment on this very on this very stock this one view stock and this and they just told the they told the exact story you know they said well this is this has gone up because a whole lot of emails have gone out and that's the story and that's what happened there wasn't any fundamental news about the company Mm. so that you can get the real story here but most of the times like we we kicked up a fuss about this one because it was super blatant and it was a story like you it goes up like 150 percent it's like almost like the methodology worked too well so it was super obvious and i mean it's there's no but downside for them. You know, they've, they've made great money out of it. But I think the key point here is we're going to see more of this. Look at look at the money they're making like this. We will see more of it. Like that's profitable, right? Yeah, well, if, you get, if you invest a million at six cents, email hundreds of thousands of people to, you know, let, let me just read an, an excerpt from their email, okay? Sure. It's, a, it's called, it's a subheading. It says, an, anal- an analogy that might help explain why we, why we are so excited about one, so they just have the capitalized letters O O N E because that's the ticker, right? You know that sinking feeling when you first get on an airplane and the plane is old and doesn't have touch screens in the back of the seat? You know the next few hours are going to be awful. Imagine if you suddenly have to go to hospital, you get wheeled into your room and that you see that your bed doesn't have one view, dot, dot, dot. Or worse, imagine if the hospital tries to put your sick parent, partner or child into a bed without one view. I personally wouldn't stand for it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And get this, get this. I don't know who the... So this writing, you know, it's like supposedly from the heart. But who is the I personally in that? Yeah, I'm not I, couldn't, sure I, didn't, who it is. I couldn't find the answer to that. Did you no. see if they had like... I didn't see a name. Is there no. a character? There's no name on this. So there's no person that's willing to put their name and say, this is the thing that I wrote. And yeah. emailed out to like hundreds of thousands of people. Okay. Yeah. And I, so yeah. That's the thing for you right there. This is what I'm saying. Like, this is financial advice. This is coming from a financial advisor without a name. Yeah. It's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's hitting people's inbox. Yeah. And it's, and this is the thing we talk about on this show and on our other shows a lot. And you do it at a rich life is just take care about where you get your information from. 
right? Like, and I guess a lot of the people listening to this know this t- this type of shit goes on in the industry where uh, if you're not paying, someone else is. So just you got to know where the incentives are. But it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a thing. I'm, I'm, maybe I won't say it's a problem. Everyone's got to make money. Everyone's got to make money. We're not criticizing companies for making money and for people making money from selling investment research or whatever. But just know if you're not paying, someone else is is paying for that. And um, there there is um another thing here which is kind of like. I want to tie this back to the company itself. So the company itself and many small caps do this. Um, they need, you know, they want PR because they want people to talk about them because they want to get attention for their company for one reason or another. But this company has gone out and, and made an agreement to get publicity, but the fundamentals of the business haven't changed. Right. But there's no, as far as I can tell, I mean, they've got, I think it was like a few hundred grand or a million dollars into their coffers. Um, so that was maybe one fundamental change to the business. But other than that, Mm. um, there wasn't anything that I could see. Well, it also, it was a, it was a cap raising at a pretty low price as well. Right. Like I think that, Mm. you know, they initially floated at, you know, some high price, like in a dollar range or whatever. So they've come down a long way and, and now they're trying to, so tell the turnaround story and just heaps of people ready to jump on board and it becomes this sort of self-fulfilling um, prophecy where people reckon they're going to make a, a quick buck and they're all jumping in. And and you know what? You know, like the, the irony is that at six cents or whatever, you know, actually probably, you know, you could make a reasonable case that, that the company is undervalued. Mm. Um, and if you put out a piece of work that sort of was an article and it, and it sort of said, you know, we reckon if if this if this if these advisors said you know we reckon this is great value at six cents and we reckon it's good value all the way up to ten cents that would probably you know be less intense mm. than just this like report about how you like this stock and it's almost if I was trying to make this company like fly and get people to buy it at more than it's worth then I would not put in any price that I thought was like or where right. I had bought, if I bought at six cents, you know, if I bought a stock at six cents and I just wanted to make it fly, I would just, you know, never tell someone that I bought at six cents and people just, they're new, they're not very savvy. They just see the share price going up and they just uh, jump on board. They don't really know how to do valuations and nothing in, in that piece of advice sort of mm. points you to valuation. So, so it's yeah. just hot stop stuff. Yeah, that's the thing. So we look. We we said at the top of the show, the small caps can attract. It can be a bit like the Wild West. There are cowboys. So, but then just mm-hmm. sorry, sorry to cut you off. But just my last point on this on this company and this sort of this paid promotion that we saw is that um that in their scorecard now that they that they're showing. And I also got a screenshot of. They had the you know our entry price of one view is eight cents, and then they display. The highest price is twenty two cents, and then the far right hand side highlighted in, in as green. You know the highest return, um, as well as they also have the current price and the current return. But um, that price eight cents. That was the I don't know. Like, that was basically the price that the shares closed at before they sent out their report. But anyone who bought shares in the report would have paid like after the report would have paid above fourteen cents. And so I don't know. But I wonder about all of these other companies that they say that they've um, put in their current portfolio of investments. Those our entry price, you know, I wonder if the people following their advice get their entry price or if they pay more, like more than double or something like that. Um, I wonder how this all turns out for the people that are following this stuff. I don't know. Yeah, it's concerning to say the least. Um, and I think is the the stock research industry and just investment research industry becomes more fragmented because of these online mediums, like, um, you know, companies listed outside Australia. This is a company with an AFSL, the, the one that published this. Yeah. So there are plenty that don't have an AFSL um, that don't understand the rules in Australia, but yet publish research into Australia. Um, so I, I think also the lesson here is just because it's an AF, someone has an AFSL doesn't mean that they can't be giving you, you know, conflicted advice. These guys disclose that they may have, they say they may have conflicts of interest and everything. We're not suggesting they've done anything wrong, but yeah. we're just letting people know that this is what people are allowed to do. You know, that's, that seems to be what it is all good. Yeah. 
Sorry, um, and, and you can and listeners can jump on a rich life and, and find out more about um, what exactly is going on. Um, one final piece that, that um, we wanted to talk about is just management selling. So there's sometimes there's a signal that people get from a manager who sells shares in the company that they run. Um, and we've got a good example in ProMedicus and probably a not so good example in Monash IBF. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe we can end on a good note. So start, maybe if we start with Monash IBF and then go to Prometheus. Yeah. yeah, okay, why not? Um, so, so Monash IBF is a story that I like to remember because um, a lot of the time when you have uh, someone, a director or a founder or maybe, you know, CEO selling shares, a lot of the time that's not really a useful signal that the end mm. is not. Um, but in the case of Monash IVF is, is a time when actually the final trigger for me was insider selling and I was glad it was. Uh, so, so Monash IVF, they do like their fertility clinic essentially. And they listed around the time, um, you know, there was another, uh, fertility clinic as well, Virtus. Yep. And it, you know, after listing, it had sort of decent ish p- performance and, uh, you know, I had it as an active recommendation um, f- for Motley Fool at a certain price and it did its 2016 annual report and showed revenue up 35% and, sorry, re- revenue up 25% and profit up 35%. And then what we saw um, in September was the CEO sell, sold 580K worth of shares and a board member who was like essentially like almost like a founder, but he was the medical director of the Adelaide IVF clinic that had sort of come together with the Melbourne one to form Monash IVF. Mm. And he sold over $2 million worth. And then in November 2016, um, the company said it was expecting 7% impact growth for, for H1. So it was still growing, saying it was going to grow in profit, but slower now. And then um, in May 2017, the CEO who... Um, had been there since the IPO, resigns just to take a job elsewhere, basically. Mm-hmm. And so I should I said before that selling shares was a trigger. It wasn't. It was just part of the trigger. But what had happened is previously I had seen in too many small caps, I had seen, um, you know, CEOs sell shares or insiders sell shares and CEOs quit and then just things start going wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so given that the valuation was already sort of stretched, when the CEO resigned, I sort of made the snap decision to like just say, oh, I'm going to just write a sell recommendation basically, which was, you know, I just had to say, look, <clears throat> already I was feeling a bit iffy about it. They've had some insider selling, you know, the valuation's higher now. It, it, it had gone up after these good results. And so, um, yeah, like just want to get out and be safe. And I was lucky that I, that I did that and I followed that heuristic even though I thought, you know, if this recovers now, I'm going to look, I was scared of looking silly, but yeah, basically um, not long after that, the CEO resigned and then that was in May. And then in June, the, like one of the star doctors, one of the star fertility specialists who worked at the Melbourne clinic announced that they were leaving the, leaving the company. Um, And then, you know, this was followed by like further, like bad press in the AFR saying like in, in July that doctors weren't that happy. And you know, basically for this pod, and so eventually I just stopped looking at it, but it, it sort of imploded right after that, right? Mm. And um, it had been the CEO quitting that had finally like, and plus the selling as well from insiders that had combined to make me think, oh, look, I don't have super high conviction on this. I don't have a whole lot of evidence to suggest that I'm comfortable with management. I don't even know who management's going to be. Like, I feel like the signals are that, I feel almost like, you know, management was telling me things are going to get worse just by their actions. Mm. Um, so, and then sure enough, I looked at the results for, for um, those H1 2017 results, which were kind of the ones that were about to happen um, when the CEO left, <clears throat> net profit was 15.2 million. In the, in the last half year results, net profit was 14.5 million. So essentially since that time, the company is still, it's still sort of down. <laughs> um and and yeah, so so that and its share price is down as well. And look, I don't, I don't have a view on the company now. I don't own shares. And I stopped following it years ago. But it's just an example of why, to me, like, yeah, I'm not saying you should always sell your shares if if the um, CEO quits and and sells shares. But uh, it does make me wary. 
And yeah. sometimes you, you can be right to be wary. It's an interesting, um, just like, so to, to, I guess we kind of, there is a, a straw that breaks comes back. And in this instance, it was almost like the fundamentals confirmed or management confirmed fundamentals because the fundamentals seem to be turning at the same time as you see a sale from yeah and exactly, then leave. exactly. It, so it, multiple signals that add up to to be that red flag right um yeah conscious of time mate but one more that we can end on a positive which is a company that you know it's a company that i know um which is promedicus um mm. we've had sam on the show before talking about in the business's genesis and and where it is today um how would you say contrast what you just said about you know the sell decision and the ripple effect of things that happen after the flow and effect i should say how would you contrast yeah. well, think, that with promedicus well i think actually the the story of how i've looked at management of promedicus um which does partly answer your question is is actually quite interesting because promedicus is an example of what made pushed me towards believing trying to learn more about people and just focus on um, what they do mm. um, can actually give you good signals. Uh, for me, it was important because I didn't buy shares in ProMedicus until I actually saw the CEO um, present at a, uh, I think it was a microequities maybe concept. I, I can't remember what it, what it was now, but, uh, uh, you know, one of those investor forums where CEOs come and speak. Yep. And I was looking at the stock while he was speaking and I could see the last few notices were basically, you know, him buying shares in the company and <laughs> him explaining the business to me. It was just like so compelling. <laughs> um, in And I was like, this guy's like literally probably bought shares yesterday and probably going to buy shares tomorrow. Like his money is actually where his mouth is. Him and um, sort of another, his co-founder friend still owned more than 50% of the business. So it very, very, uh, very much looked like they, they were in control. So I knew, I knew that I would be trusting them. Um, but also I felt that, that, you know, the, he was trying to stand up there and say, Hey, like we've been trying to knit together this for quite some time. And we've literally just won our first con big contract with this sort of new product we've been working on. And that makes it an exciting time for the company. And, you know, if I saw that now, I would just be like, Oh man, I'm going into massive position. Like you know, I wouldn't be able to help myself. But I looked, of course, I did the research on the industry and did all the usual due diligence stuff that you do when you think it's like, it's not enough just to see all oh, the, the CEO likes it and he's buying shares. Yeah, sure. That's enough to make me have a look. I definitely am not saying that is enough on its own to buy shares in a company. I then looked and, and checked out and basically what his presentation did was pr uh, prompt me to look at the movement of um, deconstructed packs, uh, picture archive communication systems. So I won't cover the whole PME business um, as as we, we we both talked about it plenty of times elsewhere, but yeah, that was a that sort of like initial impression. Like you know, for me, looking at director trades and director holdings, that's part of management assessment, obviously. So that's why we've been talking it so much, and so that sort of helped push me into it. Like you know, obviously, many years have happened after that, and the share price gets up. Mm, I can't remember exactly, maybe around six or seven dollars, and they have the AGM, and I think it was in the AGM. Or, I can't remember exactly when they did it. Maybe it was with an annual report, but at some point they put out an announcement that said um, the you know the two founders are planning on selling. I think it was three million shares each in the yeah, next few years know. or whatever. Yeah, and so and then the first time they sold shares, it might have been around. I can't remember. Do you remember, mate? No, I don't remember the first time, but I remember it being one of the times it was recently. Um, I think this was the final installment. I could yeah, be wrong. Yeah, this was the. I think this was the final lot came out. Yeah, the final lot like of the three million dollars. Yeah, it's forty three dollars sixty when I'm looking at it right now. So, yeah, yeah. but I think they I mean, might have sold at forty six even. Did they? I can't remember. I'm pretty sure they sold at thirty six million in the last at thirty six dollars. So they got yeah. 30, they sold thirty six million in the each. Anyway, it right, was anyway. it was well well scripted, right? Like they told you in advance, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, so that was really calming. Yeah. But also, you know, it did often come down after they sold their shares. But then, it, you know, each time they sold it was high. I think let's just say for the sake of the argument, they sold it around seven or eight, and then they sold it around thirty something, and then they were sold it around forty something. So each time it was still going up when they when they sold more shares. But you know, every time the market did, people would. When they sold shares the second time, you know, lots of people saying, oh, you know, trying to make it out like, oh, they're dumping shares as if that means they don't have conviction or whatever. But 
I mean, fair enough. They own more than half of the company. They were selling, maybe it wasn't a million shares, maybe it was 1%. I think that's might have what it been. So they still, between the two of them, held control of the company. And the share price was on a massively generous multiple that the market loves it now. So I don't think it means that they don't believe in the business at all is essentially what it comes down to. I, I, you may argue, I also sold some shares in ProMedicus as well around mm-hmm. current prices. So, you know, I'm not saying I think it's cheap now and I'm buying. Um, I think yeah. I think the, the signal here is twofold. So on the one hand, we know from the examples that we've covered is that management can give you pause for thought even before you buy a company, while you own it, mm-hmm. and maybe even after you own it. But then... The other thing is that great management can be a very strong signal that you can have conviction. You can increase your conviction when you know that there's a good operator. And whether like there, there's a whole list of things that go into making someone a good operator and a good management team in, at large. Some of the things that we've co- I've talked about, Claude, are in terms of communication, having a management team that is kind of transparent in the first place and willing to deal with unpredictability when you ask questions. Like, are they prepared to, uh, to let you ask questions in the first place? What kind of questions are they going to set up on the call? Um, skin in the game. You know, we mentioned at the end there, we talked about ProMedicus. Even after they sold, just for people that don't know, they still had, I believe, over $900 million worth of shares. So, hmm. you know, it's talk about yeah. significant skin in the game. Um, you mentioned that, um, you know, management teams can be a cause for, a turnaround in their own right. Um, and if you find a good horse that has a poor yeah, job. A change, in, a change in management is has the same potential as an inflection point in like a business development. In, in, that's what I'd, I'd posit. Yep. And then um, we'd like... Mm, go on. Go on with your summary. It's excellent. Um, one more would be that um, management can confirm the fundamentals of a business, whether that's good or bad, and probably vice versa, mm. to be honest. Like they're, yeah, they're- so... And so another point that I don't know if I said explicitly, but I think belongs in this summary is like, look at how, how cheeky are the metrics and stuff they put forward. Yeah. Um, if they are reporting, say, underlying profit, which is after currency movements, do they make it equally prominent when currency movements have gone for them as against them? Um, or do they sort of take advantage of it when something goes their way and, and put that forward? You know, do they put... Um, do they report on free cash flow at all or do they just report on underlying EBITDA? You know, free cash flow is a more quality metric in my opinion. And, and you know, yeah. with recurring revenue, do, do they simply report recurring revenue? Do they report um, annualised recurring revenue? Because that's recurring revenue is how much genuinely recurring revenue did you just book in the half? Annualised recurring revenue is usually like we're annualising the most recent month. So that's more yeah. sort of aggressive. And then contracted annualised recurring revenue is sort of, a super airy fairy number that's like we've signed contracts that will result in us getting this much annualized recurring revenue at some usually unnamed point in the future. Yeah, that's a good way to anyway, summarize that. So, so looking at how conservative or bullish management are, do they expense software development? That's a classic one that you and I would encounter sometimes. Yeah. Um, one the final one is um, I prefer management teams with technical skills. It's, you do too, by the sounds of it. So, yes. yeah, and yeah, I, I mean, this is um, just cherry picking. So I keep that in mind. Survivorship bias, all that. But in the case of ProMedicus, we had a, a medical doctor, and we had a developer come together to create a company that creates medical software. So um, it's yeah, kind exactly. of a, a match made in heaven. So that again, you know, cherry picking, but um, something to go on. Claude, there's so much we talked about. In this in this episode, an hour and seventeen minutes, mate. Wow. I think I think it's a good a good time to wrap it up then. But it's it's been really fun. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, and yeah, this is this will be something that I sort of can even you know listen to myself to remind myself of of my belief that really just thinking about and getting and oh, this is my last final lesson really on yeah, this subject, which is that <laughs> it is not just a matter of how much you study a company but it is actually partly about how long have you followed the company's story. You can come to a company and and look at its history and read its history and and do your best to imagine what your expectations would have been four years ago when the CEO said whatever it was then so that you can match up with what happened in the future. 
That's a good technique, but nothing beats really following it a company in real time. And I believe because humans are so complex, we do take, you know, you might make a bad, a really good CEO might make a bad impression on you the first time you sort of encounter their company um, for whatever reason. And people take time to like really figure out whether they do have, um, whether they do trust each other essentially. And so for that reason, I think that the, the, the most important thing in terms of judging management is just following along for in real time with some companies that you're, you're interested in. Mm. Um, because that gives you an edge that no one can really like replicate the exact experience as well. So that's a really good way. You know, you are a person that goes about your life making judgments about other people and who you want to trust all the time. Like we all essentially have our own methods of, of doing that. And they're, they're usually similar, but you can use those everyday life skills if you just follow a company and, and get to know it and get to know the people managing it. Uh, and that can be very useful exercise. And it's something I do a lot. Great. Well summarized, mate. Awesome. So Claude Walker from A Rich Life. I'll put links in the show notes to Claude's website. Um, check him out. Um, you can subscribe to the free newsletter. Um, you can get um, hopefully you can get on the list to join his supporters program too if he if he lets us in um claude as always mate thanks for taking the time out thanks a lot thanks owen Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion dollars as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.